<laughs> Hi everyone, Anthony Fantano here, internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you're doing well. And it's time for another edition of Let's Argue, where I hop on the internet, I take your hot takes, your unpopular opinions, your tough questions. I respond to the best ones in this video, quite literally. You, you know, you know. Uh, but uh, now we're doing a bit of a theme, a focus, a topic. I asked all of you what, in your opinion, uh, what, what is the most underrated album? Not in terms of score or anything, but reception, general discussion, acceptance into the, the, the great music canon. Let's go. Yay by Kanye. A lot of fans never appreciate it, but it's a masterpiece. Well, I wouldn't say it's a masterpiece, but I think its brevity and its rawness have turned a lot of fans off. Uh, but I implore, you know, do do go back and try to uh, listen to what Kanye is saying on that record about his mental health, uh, how catchy some of the ideas on there as as rough around the edges as they are uh, may be when, when you try to observe them in a somewhat objective way. And I think Kanye on this project, even though it is pretty short, uh, does a very good job of exploring his mental state at the time of creating this music and uh, considering everything else going on around him at the time. Uh, it's, it's a pretty accurate picture, I would like to think, and a pretty uh, um, passionate picture. Is it as epic or as grand or as well put together as, uh, you know, like College Dropout or uh, Late Registration or even My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy? No, I guess not. But uh, I, I wish fans wouldn't go out of their way to uh, write it off or disrespect it. You know, in, in that respect, um, I, I do think it is a little underrated. It's worth consideration, and that's the thing. I feel like there are a lot of fans out there who just aren't giving it consideration. Chinese Democracy, 80 minutes of overblown in a good way, November rains, style loops, hot leads, walls of guitars, and epic songwriting. It was a critic's toilet because it just sounds like some other band or two of them at the same time. I don't know if I would go so far as to say Chinese Democracy from Guns N' Roses, obviously, is uh, underrated, but maybe it's a record that's uh, kind of overhated. I get that there are piss poor tracks on the album, especially the more industrial cuts on the record that don't really meld all that well with the band's hard rock style. And honestly, the way the, the, the group embraced some of those aesthetics was quite goofy and stupid and cringy. However, when they drift away from that, uh, Chinese Democracy does actually offer some pretty good songs. So uh, again, maybe not underrated, but overhated. It's not the worst record in the world, and I guess Guns N' Roses' uh, uh, transition into some slightly industrial tracks wasn't nearly as cringy as, like, let's say, uh, The Clash's transition into whatever the fuck they were doing on Cut the Crap. RJD2's Dead Ringer. It's an amazing Def Jux instrumental hip-hop album with a strong concept that goes toe-to-toe, -to -toe, in my view, with the introducings and donuts of the genre. It's really unfortunate how it's just sort have been forgotten, especially with amazing tracks like Ghost Rider. I kind of disagree. I think this album is properly rated. Uh, for it to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the introducings and the donuts of the genre, it would need to be like a top 10 or like a top five instrumental hip-hop album, and it's it's not. I feel like it's um <clears throat> it's maybe more of like a top 25 or a top 30 instrumental hip-hop record. I mean, look, it's got some good grooves on it, and there are some sample choices that I think are pretty cool. Uh, and some of the turntablism on the record isn't all that bad either, but still, I think some of the grooves and sound play and sound palettes explored on the album aren't really all that exciting or aren't nearly as novel as a lot of the instrumental hip-hop records that uh, were dropping around the same time. I mean, look, the record is by no means terrible, and uh, I, I think the record does get quite a bit of praise. Uh, in the instrumental hip-hop community generally. Black on Both Sides by Mos Def. It has a major hit, Miss Fat Booty, and the album gives you an insight into the black experience. Hip-hop, Love, Do It Now, Got Mathematics, and Umi Says have aged extremely well too. Mos was ahead of his time, and I feel he doesn't get his flowers. I think if you're a true blue hip-hop head, Black on Both Sides and Mos Def in general ranks, like they get priority on, you know, a best album or a best 
rapper type of list. The thing about most stuff today is that, uh, much like Missy Elliott, there, there has been a point in time where he has disappeared from the mainstream and disappeared from music essentially, and as a result, um, of him playing it so low key, I think he just hasn't really translated to a lot of younger listeners these days. It's, it, it seems almost as if like, it doesn't matter how timeless the music you put out is, if you're not there like, grinding in the limelight on social media, doing features, making connections, and sort of reminding people that you're there. Because even if you've put out that classic shit, if you're not always like jumping in front of people's faces and saying, hey, 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 I made a bunch of fucking classic shit back in the 2000s, listen to it, bitch, uh, nobody's gonna do it. Uh, which is kind of sad. I, I feel like that wasn't as much the case uh, when I came of age listening to music. Although, uh, these days, you're, you're just really deluged with music from all sorts of eras and tons of new artists through the internet, so I, I imagine it can be pretty easy to just totally immerse yourself in just, like, either new shit or artists that might be older but are still doing their due diligence to remind you that they're there and you should listen to their back catalog. So, uh, again, in terms of, like, younger listeners, newer listeners, I kind of agree. I, I don't think most stuff has fully translated. Translated, and maybe my theory is that it's because maybe a lot of them don't don't really know he exists. They don't know this album is here, and if they don't, please listen to this record because it is fucking great. New World Water, uh, which you actually did not mention over here, is one of my favorite hip hop songs of all time. Uh, amazing. Mesh and Lace by Modern English. It is almost never talked about in terms of influential post punk, and it's some of the nastiest, most thought provoking pieces of music in the genre. Modern English in general needs more respect in America at least. Annie is undead always coming through with those hot goth recommendations. And honestly, I'm familiar with Modern English's more popular stuff. I didn't even know they, they did some goth shit. And uh, going back and listening to this, it's pretty decent. I think there are some elements of it that seem a little stereotypical for the style at the time, but there are some incredibly experimental and bold uh, sounds and noises placed throughout this record. Also like some, some tape, uh, sounds too, and uh, just just some weird, freaky, uh, again, sound play uh, that I really admire, even if the songs and, and the style at the core of the whole thing isn't necessarily the most groundbreaking I've heard. Um, still a lot of daring ideas going on on this record, so it, it would seem that uh, modern English has uh, more going on under the surface of their um, hits and their most popular stuff, so hell yeah. Buy Mui Drugs. Buy Mui Drugs. That fucking dead Mark Vesey and Azaria's project with Quelle Chris and most deaf and open mic eagle god like nobody I know even knows about it. It's so good. Yeah, I listened to it at the time it dropped. I thought it was uh, just okay. It wasn't doing a whole lot for me. I believe I might have even mentioned it in a Why You Know review, but still. I think there's some pretty bold and noisy ideas on this project, and I do want to maybe give the record a bit of shine here, because I've always felt bad that um, that I that I didn't really like the record, because I feel like it's still an experimental, noisy, slightly industrial hip-hop release that a lot of other people would totally fuck with, but I'm still not that crazy about it. That being said, I, I do still appreciate Denmark Vesey's mind. I still think he's a really creative dude and uh, uh, has a lot of cool stuff bubbling up there. Even if I haven't really been blown away by one of his projects so far, I think that he is definitely an artist, definitely a rapper who more people need to know about. Red Burns, Standing on the Corner. It is once in a blue moon when I see another person praise this album for what it is. It deserves to be known. It's a beautiful piece of experimental hip-hop from creators with an intense New York jazz background. It's incredibly wealthy thought out and pieced together perfectly. Its transitions from song to song are flawless and the production is astounding. Not to mention there are awesome features from Mike and Leela Romani on the album. I could talk about this album for years and I hope you do good sir. I am glad you are passionate about it. That being said, I'm a little mild on this LP. I think it's um properly rated. 
as of right now. I think uh, uh, it's it's got a strong cult following to it, and understandably so. There are a lot of very unique elements to this album that I think are very cool, and just as you say and describe here, uh, the way hip hop, experimental music, and jazz all come together, flow together on this thing, it's um, a pretty unique experience. That being said, there are some elements of the project that I'm not super crazy about. I don't really care for a lot of the uh, manipulated, somewhat cartoony spoken word passages that happen at various points on the whole thing. I, I, I feel they're kind of grating, and I feel like they take away from a lot of the uh, beautiful music going on in the background. Uh, they just come off really distracting to me. The passages that aren't really hinging on that uh, are pretty great. Never Forever by Kate Bush. Hounds of Love hogs most of the discussion around her work, but she has consistently put out great work over her entire career, especially Never Forever. Not only great singles like Babushka and Arm Dreamers, but great deep cuts like Delius and Blow Away. If you enjoy Hounds of Love, please listen to anything and everything she did in the 1970s and the 80s. You can't really go wrong. Pretty much every project around that time is fantastic. Uh, however, I will say I understand why a project like Never Forever wouldn't translate as much as uh, Hounds of Love. I mean, the songs aren't nearly as snappy. There's a way bigger progressive rock influence on the songs on there, as it's it's a pretty progressive pop album. And um, that, that style, that vibe, that aesthetic hasn't necessarily uh, uh, carried over into uh, this newest generation, whereas like new wave and 80s pop and, you know, big, grand uh, 80s type anthems, which Hounds of Love, you know, has those in spades, are very much uh, more popularized in the current musical paradigm. But still, for someone who is a bit more of a patient listener, uh, Never Forever is fantastic and uh, certainly underrated generally in the uh, Kate Bush discography, even though it's, it's you know, a very popular discography. Adam Hart Mother, because it's perfect and one of Pink Floyd's most experimental, and no one ever talks about it. Um, I do like the title track. The title track has a lot of awesome and epic phrases in it, and certainly points to uh, a lot more of the progressive and uh, forward-thinking songwriting and instrumentation the band would continue to dabble in later uh, in their career. But I'm not, I'm not crazy about the second half. I know I have a lot of like controversial Floyd opinions, but uh, I will say I'm not as crazy about uh, 60s Floyd as much as I am 70s Floyd. And Adam Hart Mother is a project that very much like you know sits on the fence. Like obviously uh, the title track is is a is is a peak of what's to come, and still you know great on its own merit, uh, but everything that follows that in the second half is just like, you know, left over from uh, all their 60s stuff, their sunshine, psych type stuff, uh, and and I'm, I'm just not really crazy about that era. Uh, a lot of it sort of uh, falls flat for me. Uh, as innovative and as, uh, I guess, as um, important to uh, that era and that niche, that genre, as uh, records like Saucer Full of Secrets certainly were. Adam Hartmother, while it is good, it's uh, really just two, um, I, I guess, a tale of two sides of the band uh, to, uh, to really feel all that cohesive. Untitled Unmastered. I feel like most people just pass it off as cool and listen to T-Pab instead, but it's so much more. Definitely agree. I wouldn't necessarily go as far as to say it's underrated because the album is currently housed and understood to be a part of uh, one of the better modern hip-hop discographies. That being said, I wish uh, the record could break, and I think it will with, with time, uh, this perception that it's just simply a bunch of T-Pab leftovers, and that's all it is, because it's very much not. I mean, for sure, like, a lot of that material was coming out of those sessions and was born out of a similar mindset, but it is assembled and produced and groomed in a very particular way to create a wholly different experience. You know, it's 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 like um, Endless to Blonde, in a way. You know what I mean? Uh, they're two albums. They came out next to each other. They're obviously connected in a lot of very significant ways, but, um, you know, one does not need to be sacrificed at the hand of the other. Uh, the, the record that is a little rough around the edges, a little more experimental, all that, it uh, has a personality of its own. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not just riding on the coattails of the other 
or anything. It's, it's a legitimately great project uh, with some awesome ideas on it. Weezer, Pinkerton. It is not acknowledged nearly as much as their Blue album, while arguably being uh, of the same or better quality. What are you talking about? Pinkerton by Weezer is one of their most beloved records. People love the shit out of that album. Like, when I say that Blue is better than Pinkerton, there is no shortage of, like, emo boys in my comments being like, Fuck you, Anthony! You're stupid! Pinkerton's better than blue. Blah, 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 blah. So, no, it's it's not underrated. It's properly rated. It is rated. It's rated very highly. People love the record. It's not underrated. Soviet Kitsch by Regina Spector. It's sad to see how much praise her albums receive from those who have heard it, and yet she never gets as much attention as any other artists like her, such as Fiona Apple. Soviet Kitsch was unique, pretty experimental compared to some of her other work, and incredibly enjoyable. Also, 11 of 11 was a very good record too, but yes, Soviet Kitsch was the record that made me fall in love with Regina Spector's music. I, I feel like after this album, she was just like widely accepted into the indie scene, and as a result, she started making much more commercial music like immediately after, and I just think her sound and her style really fell off hard, but uh, she has bounced back uh, quite impressively in recent years and I'm very happy about that but uh, uh, through that time with her putting out so many records that haven't uh, really withstood the test of time I feel like there are a lot of people that aren't really going back and listening to Soviet Kitsch which is just like a really great you know piano backed singer songwriter record with a lot of quirk a lot of personality a lot of wit a lot of fire to it as well and yeah you know regina is heavily inspired by someone like fiona apple and uh uh you know if you're into her music you will most likely enjoy regina's early work too shibuboshi i hope i'm saying that correctly an amazing japanese fusion album uh this was a record prior to this comment i had no fucking clue what it was but yeah i looked it up on youtube and it is a crazy loud blistering <laughs> mind-blowing and expanding uh, fusion of jazz and rock. It's pretty noisy and abrasive as well. Certainly a, a, a gem that uh, is, is waiting to be discovered by a lot of people out there. Uh, check this record out. It's insane. Indie Cud by Kid Cudi. It's not perfect, but it has some amazing aspects, most notably the production. The production was trippy experimental, and it was handled almost solely by Cuddy. Uh, yeah, it, it was handled almost solely by him, but it's it's so rudimentary. It's so rudimentary. Uh, and going back and listening to this, there are a lot of unflattering moments on the LP. I guess one thing that was surprising going back and listening to this LP, I still don't like it, but uh, still. One thing that was surprising was just how much Cuddy's vocals resembled that of like, just like a rock singer on the record. And I guess it's not the first time he's dabbled in the genre at this point. I mean, you did have like a, a moment or two on uh, Man on the Moon 2. And you did also, he, he was fresh off that Wizard record as well. But it's it's almost like you, you can hear him progressing progressing towards speeding bullet to heaven he's 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 not quite there but he, he's on he's on his way he's well on his way fishman's 98 12 28 the live record uh it was the last ever live performance of uh, frontman shinji sato and it's the best live album ever made. Live albums in general are pretty underrated. I guess in general they are, but um, I, I don't think it's the greatest live album of all time. I mean, it's got some great performances on there, and uh, I love the more experimental tracks on the record, but Fishman's discography in general is very hit or miss for me. Uh, obviously, Long Season is incredible, and the recording of Long Season on this live album is really impressive too, uh, but their records are admirably in a way a really cool fusion of um a lot of popular 90s styles including like reggae and also like late 90s jam bandisms and the songs of theirs that go into a more reggae direction whether they be on a studio record or on this live album are just a huge like turnoff for me total non-starter. I just don't get the appeal. I, I really, truly don't. Uh, but the songs of theirs that, that do uh, uh, traverse into more psychedelic and uh, uh, dreamier elements and, and ideas uh, speak to me a lot more. And um, again, long season is uh, amazing as hell. So I guess ultimately with Fishman's, uh, though I will agree, uh, the album is underrated 
like in the grander scheme of things, as across the music industry, across writer circles, there isn't a whole lot of love or attention paid to Fishman's. Uh, but if you go on to like rate your music, the, the, their music is like overrated as hell. So <laughs> one day, I hope we reach a point where uh, we have like some kind of balance here where um, m maybe they're not as like obsessed over in this very small online music community and they have like a bit more recognition and respect in, in, in the outside world. I built an evil empire out of some crazy garbage called the blood of the exploited working class. Boom, boom. And I think we are going to leave it at that. Everyone, thank you very much for watching. Uh, this has been my thoughts on a lot of underrated albums you threw in my way, threw in my face. I hope y'all are doing well, and uh, hopefully got some good recommendations of maybe some uh, albums and artists that either you hadn't heard or hadn't uh, considered maybe taking the time to uh, listen to or re-examine. Uh, you're the best. Anthony Fantano, underrated albums forever.